For nearly 30 years, legendary reporter John Drummond worked right here at CBS2. He was best known for covering the city's top lawbreakers, but his resume spanned far beyond the underbelly of Chicago's organized crime. Tonight, a look back into the CBS2 vault. There are some of John Drummond's most memorable stories. Here he is in the 1989 special Crooks, Characters, and Capers. Straw that broke the camel's back when Lou Barnes fumbled. These are disappointed Bears fans, upset over a 1987 loss in the playoffs. You could hear, I thought I was on the forecastle of a tramp steamer. The way the oaths and curses went up. Now, we're going to try to talk to some of these fans, and if they get unruly, we go back to you. Listen, knock it off. I'm John Drummond. I'm a reporter here at Channel 2, and have been working the street for the past 20 years. That's a lot of time in covering crooks, characters, and capers. Most of our stories take place in TV's version of the trenches. You see, on our beat, as a rule, we don't visit exotic ports of call. And we're not on a first-name basis with potentates, tycoons, or presidents. Sometimes it's not a job for the Ken and Barbie types, who would be better off staying in the studios. We're being bombarded with debris. Is this for Good Morning America? No, 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 sir. This is for CBS. Oh, we've met our share of the rich and famous. We've interviewed presidents and presidents-to-be. Well, I don't think the president should resign. We've talked to show business biggies. And we've had one-on-ones with some of Hollywood's brightest stars. Right. Is this going to be a portent? Are you going about the country uh, barnstorming for various candidates? Well, uh, what do you mean ab ab about the country? Through the years, we've chatted with some immortals and other heavyweights of the sports world. And we interviewed Mike Ditka when the former Pittsburgh All-American was still wearing a crew cut. Well, John, I think the uh, mental attitude's real good. I think we're going to be able to give the Packers a real good football game. And we visited the Italian-American Boxing Hall of Fame dinner in Rosemont, where we found more champion pugilists present than any cauliflower alley gathering at Madison Square Garden. Not everyone, though, wants to smile for the birdie. Some people get upset at the sight of a camera. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll take you over to detox. And oh, try come on, get that thing out of here. Come on, watch your language. And not all of the movers and shakers care to answer our questions either. Longtime AFL-CIO boss like George Meany was one of them. What do you think? How do you assess Mr. Ford as far as, as, far as labor is concerned? You're trying, I'll say that for you. <laughs> never give up. Most of our assignments aren't very glamorous. We've covered more meetings of legislative bodies and government agencies than we care to remember. But usually, our microphones take us to where the wise guys and characters are. This is not going to be a compendium of the most important events that occurred in the Chicago area in the past 20 years. You can get that somewhere else. Some of the stories we will tell you about made headlines. Many did not. They're stories off the beaten path. Stories about real people. Stories about the city's underbelly. So, stay with us. The new CBS Chicago app is the best way to get award-winning investigations, as much breaking as live as coverage, so as help with a new career, are unemployed. whenever, wherever, with just one tap. It's all on CBS Chicago. John Conti was an enforcer, a leg breaker for the Chicago mob. Conti, that's not his real name, used to be a juice loan collector for the outfit but got into hot water when he skipped to Arizona and started getting chummy with the feds. But before he went underground, Conti told us in a silhouette interview how he would discourage recalcitrants from welching on their debts. He was in a Louisville slugger and gives him a little whack in the knees. And then every time he sits down, he knows that he didn't pay and he's got to pay. Cigar chomping Jasper Campisi, like Conti, was another outfit soldier who toiled many years in the crime syndicate vineyards. According to authorities, Campisi and this man, John Gattuso, a former Cook County Sheriff's deputy, botched an assignment given to them by mob superiors. The assignment, investigators say, was to liquidate Ken Edo, who was known on the streets as Tokyo Joe. Edo, a major figure in the Balita racket, had been convicted on gambling charges, and syndicate biggies were concerned he might end up 
talking to the wrong people. Edo was shot three times in the head, but miraculously survived. And Edo named Campisi and Gattuso as the would-be assassins. Edo joined the witness protection program and garbed like a medieval executioner, told his story to the president's crime commission. Five months after the bungled murder attempt, the case was settled out of court. The bodies of Campisi and Gattuso were found in the trunk of a Volvo. I think this is a message to other crime syndicate individuals that if they uh, mess up, if they botch a job as Gattuso and Campisi did, this is what their reward is going to be for long years in the crime syndicate, is to wind up in the trunk of a car. No such fate will ever be in store for Tony Accardo. Accardo has never even spent a night in jail, and at 83, investigators say, the Big Tuna is the chairman emeritus of the Chicago crime syndicate. His tenure at the top is unmatched in mob circles around the country. In his halcyon days, Accardo lived in this 25-room mansion in River Forest. Although Accardo sold the property in the late 1960s, many of the amenities still remain. They include a 20 by 40 foot indoor pool, lined and surrounded by blue and white marble, a bowling alley with twin lanes, and a bathroom with gold-plated fixtures. Authorities took one last shot at Accardo in 1984 when they hauled him before a Senate committee in Washington. But in a two-hour session, a straight-faced Accardo told the Solons that he knew nothing about any organized crime activity in Chicago. We have information which may be said to be general public information that you headed the Chicago Organized Crime Syndicate for many years. Isn't that true? No, sir. That is not true? No, sir. Have you ever been associated in any way with any illegal activity? Yes, sir. Is that? What, what, what were those uh, illegal activities? Huh? What were those activities? <coughs> I gambled. Have you ever killed anyone? No, sir. Have you ever directed anybody to commit murder? No, sir. What was your association with Mr. Al, uh, with Al Capone? None association at all. Just friendly. Hello and how are you? Although senators didn't believe Accardo's testimony, no attempt was made to cite him for perjury. The 1982 trial of former Teamsters President Roy Williams and four other men was the first major case in which court-approved electronic eavesdropping played a key role. Concealed cameras and hidden microphones are now standard fare in federal prosecutions. But without wiretaps, it's unlikely that Williams and the other defendants would have been convicted. And this excerpt from a Williams conversation is an example of a tap where the technical quality is excellent. I'm not going to forget it because we sat right there and committed ourselves. Sometimes investigators plant bugs similar to these in a suspect's office or home. In the Williams case, authorities planted a listening device in a chair at the insurance office of Alan Dorfman. The bug picked up some incriminating remarks made by Dorfman that led to his conviction. Roy Williams just had his book that came right off and says, you've got the practice, don't worry about it. Electronic eavesdropping had nothing to do with the conviction of Charlie Marzano and some of his confederates. Lawmen say Marzano was the mastermind of the 1974 Purelater heist. More than $4 million was taken from the vault at the Purelater warehouse on the near north side. It was the biggest theft in history at the time. One million dollars of the loot is still missing. And some sleuths think that Marzano knows where the money is. When Charlie was released from prison, we were there to ask him if that was true. Nine years after the Pier Later heist, that, that there's a million dollars missing and you know where it is. What's your, what's your rejoinder to that? Fallacy. To this day, the missing one million dollars has not been recovered. Only a few blocks north of the former Purelater warehouse is Levinson's Jewelry Store. It was there in December of 1977 that a gang of professional thieves circumvented the alarm system and had a field day inside the store. They might have had a truck out there. They clean out the store, all the watches and everything else out of the showcases, broke the showcases. The store was impressive, one million dollars worth of jewelry. The swag, authorities believe, was stashed in Tony Accardo's then River Forest home. According to police, the Levinson burglars foolishly tried to retrieve the loot and broke into Accardo's house. It was a costly mistake. Soon the bodies of five burglars began cropping up in car trunks. All had been tortured before they were murdered. The killers have never been apprehended. Hey, we had a 
511 over there on over there by Sears in the south side. You meet a lot of characters on the crime beat. There was Fat Albert, who showed up with regularity at the scene of fires. Chicago firemen felt that when Fat Albert couldn't find a fire to watch, he'd set one of his own. In 1976, Fat Albert, whose real name is Albert Zenner, was caught setting a blaze at a Northside hotel and went to the penitentiary. We watched our crime patterns and our various fires on the near north side and the far west sides, and they went down approximately 35 to 40 percent with this man being in custody. Last we heard, Fat Albert was telling folks that he'd seen the light and was traipsing the straight and narrow. Then there was the late millionaire horseman Silas Jane. Jane, who knew his horse flesh, went to prison with two other men in connection with the murder of his younger brother George. Jane, even in his 70s, was a tough old bird willing to duke it out with men half his age. There was talk that Hollywood was going to do a movie on the Jane story, but it never materialized. Speaking of senior citizens, watch this man. My boss Joey the Dove's Ayupa is as feisty as they come. Ayupa, who friends say box professionally under the nom de guerre of Joey O'Brien, can still toss a wicked punch. In this case, he also tried to goad our cameraman into combat. I wish you'd take a whack at me. <laughs> like I wouldn't do that, sir. But the cameraman kept his cool. Big Joe Arnold, who federal authorities say formerly ran the Rush Street Rackets, is another golden ager who would see red at the sight of a camera. Five years ago, a Channel 2 news crew followed Arnold out of the federal building, much to Big Joe's displeasure. Turning into a human billy goat, Arnold charged our cameraman. <laughs> then Arnold shoved our sound man against a parked car. <laughs> that sound of agony came from the sound man, not Arnold. After venting his rage, Big Joe decided it was time to catch up with the news, and Arnold was last seen clutching a copy of USA Today against his face. Now, let's watch in slow motion Big Joe's bid to be a claimant to the Senior Citizens Heavyweight Championship. No official decision was rendered, but this observer gave Arnold the match on points. Some of the people we've met in this business aren't what we call newsmakers. As we used to say, you won't read about them in the guidebooks or travel brochures. But they have stories to tell, too. And we'll be right back in a moment with some of them. We've covered our share of bizarre stories, and one that people still ask about is the piece we did on Thomas Cornelius Jackson, who was known as the Underground Man. Jackson does not stay in any of the flop houses that dot the near west side. Instead, he bunks under the sidewalk in the 1400 block of West Madison Street. Fittingly, Jackson is known by the street people as the Underground Man, but no one seems to know why Jackson prefers to live such a mole-like existence. He'd rather be alone. That's what he wants to do. He said he don't have to be bothered with no one. He said just leave him alone. He's doing what he wants to do. The underground man's digs will never qualify for a spread in better homes and gardens or good housekeeping. But it's home sweet home for a guy who counts a few rats and a couple of collie-like dogs as his closest companions. When the leaves start to fall and the northwest winds begin to howl, the underground man leaves his subterranean lodge and heads for warmer climes. Reportedly, he winters in Florida with a financial boost from a sister. West Madison Street, where the underground man once resided, has changed considerably in recent years. By the mid-1970s, only the hardcore remained in what was once the nation's largest skid row. Doomed by demon rum, life goes on for the derelicts who still call West Madison Street their home. The Wreckers Ball has taken its toll on the once sprawling near West Side Skid Row area, but a few run-down bars remain where the wine is cheap and the conversation animated. Man, do me a favor. Get out of here. Don't you, Don't you never do that again. I'll go upside of your head. Don't never touch me again, Lee. Good morning. Good morning. How you doing? Okay. But there are those who are concerned about the fate of these down-and-outers. Deacon Peter, a member of the Catholic Charities Holy Cross Mission, left the job with R.R. R. Donnelly and Sons to work with the street people. 
Deacon Peter's boss is Monsignor Ignatius McDermott, or Father Mac, as he is known in the area. For 33 years, Father Mac's parish has been what some cynics might call the flotsam of the street. Despite the heavy odds, Father Mac has never given up trying to keep his flock off the treadmill to oblivion. Skid Row was not a piece of real estate, it's a state of mind. And uh, I found uh, alcoholics, as many alcoholics in the penthouse as I found in the flop house. As Skid Row has changed, so has Rush Street. In the pre-yuppie era, we took a tour of the area with Maury Kahn, who was called the mayor of Rush Street long before Harry Carey garnered the title. Bars featuring exotics and nude dancers dotted Glitter Gulch in the mid-1970s. Khan and I stopped for a cold one at the legendary Singapore, which by then had changed into a palace of Peel. They come in here to see the show. They come, don't come in here to meet girls. But that's as far as it goes. When they leave, they leave the Sims the way they came in alone. The Singapore and similar spots are no more. But in their heyday, they were all part of Chicago's Great White Way, where all the action was. Occasionally, our assignments take us out of town. We visited Fort Lauderdale, where the police department in the mid-70s had in their arsenal a laser-aimed 22 caliber machine gun that could spew out 177 bullets in six seconds. Because of the laser attachment, it was dubbed Super Gun. The laser emitted a pencil-thin red light, and it was an eerie feeling, to say the least, when the laser set its sights on us. Fort Lauderdale police called the laser a psychological deterrent and said at the time that an armed robber who had heard about the gun surrendered the moment he saw the laser beam. We've made several pilgrimages to Las Vegas where we've done a variety of stories. It was there that we ran into Tony and Marilyn, two working girls who weren't shy in telling us what they did to earn a living. On a good night at $100 a trick, I'm about four or five bills. You know, that's a good night where you don't have to worry, you don't have to hide from vice all night. And you don't get all these jerk-offs that don't want to do nothing. You know, they just want to sit and take up your time, be seen with a pretty girl. It's not always a gravy train, particularly on Saturdays when the scene reportedly becomes amateur night at the Y. That's when the so-called California secretaries hit town, as Marilyn, a former Indiana resident, explains. They come in the hotels, the great big hotels like Caesars and MGM, where the girls who live here know the going price is a hundred, nothing less than a hundred. They come in there and charge the guy twenty five dollars, you know, and then the guy will see you the next night and say, well, I got it last night for twenty five. You know, and you tell them, go ahead and find it. Go back to where you got it from because you're not getting it here. For the price that we charge, you know, we want distinguished clientele. I know I've had some really, I mean, bums approach me, and the minute you mention $100, they're gone, you know. So that's one of the main reason. But like for the money that we charge, they're almost guaranteed, you know, they won't take anything home to their wives. There are so many good yarns in Chicago that it's rare that you have to barnstorm around the country looking for stories. And you don't have to stray too far from the loop to find them. There's been a delicatessen on this site on Maxwell Street for over 60 years. And on a Sunday morning it becomes a social club of sorts where the street hawkers, peddlers and the curious come in to eat breakfast and talk shop. How much you want for that? Are those real diamonds or junk? The deli is owned by Nate Duncan who looks like he could play tight end for the Bears. Duncan began working at the deli as a young man, and when the owner retired, Duncan bought the restaurant and changed its name to Nate's. How did the predominantly Jewish clientele react to a black man selling kosher foods? Nate explains. It was rough. It was kind of hard for them to accept. But uh, as I went along in the years, they just accepted uh, after a year or so, and uh, just fell right in place. Everything's fine. Jewel Benjamin, like Nate Duncan, is another person who likes to work with people. Jewel was something of a trailblazer when she started driving a cab. You see, some years back, women taxi drivers were a novelty. Jewel got behind the wheel because she was tired of operating a punch press during the day and slinging hash at night. In her years on the street, Jewel has seen it all, including the time a woman had one too many at a Christmas party. And uh, I had a heck of a time getting her out of the cab, much less get the money and uh, had to put her shoe back on, her hat back on, and uh, she said, Maury, my husband's gonna kill me when I get in there. 
I helped her out of the cab and I and I took her over to a tree and, and she paid me and I told her to hold on to the tree and she'd be okay and I left. I mean, I don't know how long she held on to the tree, but I hope her husband came out and give her a hand. Terry Sullivan and Jim Heckelman go into more bars than any two-fisted drinker. It's all part of a day's work for Terry and Jim, who are agents with the Illinois Liquor Control Commission. We're with the uh, Illinois Liquor Control Commission. Yeah. We'd like to see your licenses and inspect your bar. A visit by the agents to Sam's, a bar that is not frequented by the Perrier set, proved productive. An inspection of a bottle of Early Times and a bottle of Jim Beam revealed that they were contaminated with small insects known as fruit flies. We asked Frank, the popular mixologist on duty, about the flies. I always find bar flies in there, you know. Bar, literally bar flies. Yeah. yeah, I mean, not the ones behind that bar. <laughs> At one point, the two men checked out a bottle of Martell's that didn't appear to be the real McCoy. There's no alcohol at all on it. Terry, what do you think this stuff is? It's not liquor. Tastes like tea. Next stop on the agenda was a North Milwaukee Avenue spot called the Double Doors. Double Doors, which caters to country and western clientele, advertises bargain basement prices for early morning tipplers. A quick inspection revealed several bottles of liquor contained insects. This bottle of Captain Morgan's rum had fruit flies near the bottom. But that didn't bother a patron by the name of John. Eight my bucks. Boy, they're good. You know, I get fit when I drink. Both bars were cited by the inspectors, but no violations have been reported at either bar since. People often ask me, what's the most interesting story I ever covered? There have been so many of them. But one story that continues to intrigue me is the mystery of missing candy heiress Helen Voorhees Brock. Mrs. Brock, the wealthiest woman to have ever disappeared, vanished in February of 1977. That's when Mrs. Brock, a Glenview resident, checked out of the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, where she had undergone a routine physical examination. Despite a lengthy investigation, including a number of searches for her body, authorities have been unable to pinpoint a motive for the apparent murder of Mrs. Brock. Here is a lovely lady of around 62, didn't have an enemy in the world, had a great deal of money, and so far as anyone knows, nobody had the slightest reason to do her harm. Authorities consider Mrs. Brock's longtime houseman, Jack Matlick, a suspect in the case. But Matlick, who at last report was living in the Pittsburgh area, has never been charged in connection with Mrs. Brock's disappearance. Thorough searches of Mrs. Brock's Glenview estate have yielded no meaningful clues, and lawmen apparently are no closer to unraveling the mystery than they were the day they began their investigation. All right, we're standing right here. Stories can break out at any time, and sometimes we're joined on the scene by our colleagues. There was a series of explosions, minor explosions right going on right now. The smoke is coming past us. It's a transformer down there. And occasionally we've been called upon to pinch hit as an anchor in the newsroom. The best greetings, thank you, and have a happy Easter. And thank you for sitting in for Bill for a week. The top banana's back on Monday, and I go back to being a spear carrier, but I enjoyed it. <laughs> okay. But the real excitement in this business happens on the street. Now this doesn't look like a bailiff behind me here or a, or a deputy. What's, we have your name, young lady? Candy Collins. You're a playboy, play, a, play, a bunny. That's yes, right. Sir. No comments? Well, I was going to say, okay, we, you know, I'm getting a fist. That means to keep my trap shut. Get out of here. I can give you another fist. <laughs> <laughs> you can see that tomorrow night at 5, 6, and no 10. hold fired. This is John Drummond. There's 11 pounds of duck that'll be the entree tonight on what they call duck a la orange when the president arrives here and when they sit down at the family table probably around 10 o'clock. It's a real gourmet feast apparently. A tomato herb quiche, wild rice, uh, salad and of course topped off by champagne. I might add if uh, Mr. Carter who is now at the North uh, Shore home in Glencoe of Newton Minnow uh, is uh, perhaps going to have some hors d'oeuvres tonight, may I humbly suggest uh, uh, Mr. President, you go easy on the hors d'oeuvres because you're going to have quite a feast here tonight where you'll be spending the evening at the Balandic uh, homestead. The mayor, incidentally, this afternoon ran five miles 
apparently in anticipation of the big dinner tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, moments ago you saw the two offenders, the two Croatian nationalists being taken out here in a police squad roll behind 104 South Michigan Avenue. The rest got in a police car and a police squad roll. There were two of them that were taken into custody. The details, I don't know, as you can see, a mass of photographers and uh, media types are leaving right now. Uh, details are not available. Commander McLaughlin is down there. Let's try to go down there, ladies and gentlemen. Cannot do it. All right. Okay. Uh, Paul McLaughlin, who is the first district commander, is uh, down there holding an impromptu news conference, and we're going to go down there and find out what the situation is.